Let's move on to the protozoa that can affect the bloodstream. First and foremost is malaria. Malaria is broken down into four separate species. You have Plasmodium vivax, Plasmodium ovale, Plasmodium falciparum, and Plasmodium malariae. The transmission for malaria is through the Anopheles mosquito. Our symptoms typically include fever, headache, anemia, and splenomegaly. To diagnose this, you do a blood smear and you will see a trophozoite ring that is formed within the red blood cell as the red blood cell is the host for malaria. You can also see a schizont which contains merozoites. To treat this, we use chloroquine as well as primaquine if we suspect a hypnozoite state. The, hy the hypnozoite state is the dormant form in the liver. Of note, Plasmodium vivax and plas Plasmodium ovale have a 48-hour fever cycle. So you will have fever on day one and day three and so forth. Plasmodium malariae has a 72-hour fever cycle. So you will have fever on day one and then on day four. This diagram will explain the life cycle of malaria within the body and in the mosquito. Let's start down here with number one. A mosquito will bite a host and infect it with the sporozoites. Those sporozoites then can travel to the human liver where they will form a hypnozoite stage that is dormant. This can remain in the liver for quite some time. At some point in time, the Hypnozoites can then form merozoites and pass into the bloodstream. At this point, it will go through the human blood cell cycle where it will continuously replicate until it is far enough along to form gametocytes. Gametocytes are the sexual stage of the plasmodium protozoa, which is the infectious stage. At this point, if someone receives a mosquito bite, the mosquito will actually draw the infected blood with the gametocytes into itself, where it will then undergo the mosquito stage of the virus and form oocysts. Moving on, we have babesiosis, which is caused by the babesia protozoa. This is transmitted through the exodes tick. The exodes tick bites and transmits the babesia organism. Symptoms of babesiosis includes fever and hemolytic anemia. We diagnose this with a blood smear where you see a ring form or a Maltese cross. And the Maltese cross appears like this in the blood smear. We can also do PCR to determine an infection with babesiosis. Treatment for babesiosis is atovaquone and azithromycin. We typically see the babesia organism in the northeastern United States. People most at risk for severe disease associated with babesiosis are those who are asplenic. So we immediately think someone with sickle cell anemia. Let's discuss Chagas disease. Chagas disease is caused by trypanosoma cruzi. Trypanosoma cruzi is transmitted through a bite from the reduvid bug. The reduvid bug deposits feces on the skin and the bite causes itching. The host will then scratch that bite, pushing the feces into the bite, which will then pass into the bloodstream. We mainly see these in South America. Symptoms of Chagas disease includes unilateral periorbital swelling. Advanced disease can have dilated cardiomyopathy with an apical atrophy, megacolon, and megaesophagus. To diagnose, we can do a blood smear and see the trypomastigotes in the blood smear, as you see here on the left. 
Treatment for Chagas disease is benzonidazole and nifurtamox. A way to remember the treatment is cruising in my bins with a fur coat on. So cruise is for trypanosoma cruzi. So cruising in my bins, benzonidazole, with my fur coat on, nifurtamox. Moving on, leishmaniasis is caused by the Leishmania donovani organism. It is transmitted through the sand fly. There are two different types of leishmaniasis that can cause infection. It can be a visceral leishmaniasis where we see spiking fevers, hepatosplenomegaly, and pancytopenia, or we can see a cutaneous leishmaniasis where we have skin ulcers. To diagnose this, we can use a biopsy where we see macrophages that will contain amastigotes. In this picture on the right, you can see in the bone marrow a macrophage that contains the amastigotes inside of it. Treatment is with amphotericin B and sodium stiboglucanate. Finally, trichomonas vaginalis. Trichomonas vaginalis is a sexually transmitted infection. And be careful not to confuse this with Gardnella vaginalis. Be careful not to confuse Trichomonas vaginalis with Gardnerella vaginalis. Gardnerella is a bacterial vaginosis caused by a gram variable bacterium. Trichomonas vaginalis is a protozoa. Symptoms for Trichomonas vaginalis include a foul smelling greenish discharge and it can also cause itching and burning. To diagnose, we use a wet mount, and you will see trophozoites that are motile on that wet mount. You can also see on the cervix what is known as a strawberry cervix, which is a punctate cervical hemorrhage. As you can see in this video on the left, there are many modal Trichomonas vaginalis organisms moving around in this phase contrast wet mount. Treatment for Trichomonas vaginalis includes metronidazole. Remember, get gap on the metro, so the T in get gap is Trichomonas vaginalis. We will give metronidazole to both the patient that is infected as well as their partner for prophylaxis as there is a potential that they could continue to spread. Of note, this must be transmitted sexually because the Trichomonas vaginalis protozoa cannot exist outside of the human body because it will not form cysts.